Hello and welcome to India's World. The Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP is one of the biggest trade deals in history. It was signed on February 4th in New Zealand by 12 Pacific Rim countries. These countries are Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, the United States and Vietnam. Together, these countries account for 40% of the global economy and 26% of world trade. The TPP as yet does not include China. The trade deal is aimed at dismantling tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade and investment between the participant countries. It also hopes to streamline regulations and to implement, among other things, common standards for the protection of foreign investment and intellectual property rights. However, the TPP has not come into force as yet and will have to be ratified over the next two years. In this time period, at least six member countries must approve the final text of the deal for the TPP to be implemented. The TPP is expected to serve as a model for future trade deals in other regions once it comes into being. To discuss the ramifications of the TPP, we have with us a very distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Ambassador Kaval Sibyl, a formidable diplomat. He has served as India's ambassador to Turkey, Egypt, France and Russia. We have with us Ambassador Prabhat Chukla, another eminent diplomat. He was India's ambassador to Russia and before that High Commissioner to Australia and Singapore. We have with us Dr. Nitin Desai, an eminent economist. He was Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. He was also Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs of the United Nations. I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Dr. Desai, let me begin with you. Tell our viewers what are the broad objectives of the TPP? What does it aim to do? Uh, the stated objectives of the TPP is to liberalize trade between these 12 members. Yeah. The more substantial objective of the TPP is to make the world safe for transnational capital. And in that, in some ways, this has been the trend of trade throughout because so much of trade is now within corporations. So if I had to describe it, I'd say it's basically a really great big attempt to protect the rights of transnational capital when it moves across boundaries. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Shukla, isn't the TPP quite remarkable um, uh, in, 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 in the sense that there are very different approaches and standards within the member countries, including environmental protection, workers' rights within them, regulatory coherence, because regulatory structures are different. Not to mention, of course, special protection that many of these countries give to their uh, crucial industries. SOEs and stuff, yeah. Well, look, I think it's important to cite this whole exercise in a, in a broader framework. What the Americans are doing, and this is something which you can go back to the late 70s. They have, Paul Volcker made a very famous speech about the controlled disintegration of the global economy and then the managed reintegration of the global economy. I submit that this is what is actually taking place right now because besides the TPP, you have a similar process going on between the European Union and the US. So if you put the two processes together, and hopefully they will both happen and get ratified, although there are question marks, what you then have is America really at the center of a kind of consolidation of essentially the rich countries that are already rich. And this is the kind of managed reintegration which the Americans are working on. Now, you are absolutely right. There are... Uh, varying levels of development. Vietnam is one example, for instance. But I think the, the apart from what uh, Dr. Desai just said, they have shown a little flexibility in terms of allowing people time to adjust. So the Japanese have been given time to adjust on their uh, agricultural imports. The Vietnamese have been given time to adjust the role of trade unions, the role of, the, the role of state-owned enterprises. So in that sense, there has been a degree of flexibility, but the ultimate objective is very clear, and that is that a new set of rules, much tighter than even W, it'll be going to be WTO plus. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Sibyl, is, is the aim of the agreement to create a new single market somewhat like the EU or uh, not? No, 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 not at all. Far from it. The EU uh, has a different history and uh, different reasons why they came together. Uh, here, I think uh, the United States uh, uh, wants to make sure that it retains its domination over the global economy, and especially in the Asia-Pacific area, where China has emerged of, as a very big competitor. And perhaps the calculation uh, was, the strategy is that if the United States actually doesn't become proactive, 
uh, in terms of uh, protecting its rights, shaping the economic environment of this region and benefiting uh, from it, China would move in. And then China will set the rules and China will determine uh, the integration of this uh, part of the world. So there is a very strategic uh, motivation behind it and a lot of that has to, yeah. has to do with China. In fact, you know, just a few days ago, Obama <clears throat> explicitly said this. He said that part of the, you know, that this is essentially, just, and this is why the Chinese prime minister has objected to it a couple of days day, day ago. And it is part of that. But I think within that, uh, it's not just the power of the U.S. as a government. It's also the power of U.S. corporations. Remember that when they were doing this, one of the complaints from the uh, congressmen women were, you have not, you're not telling us what you're negotiating, exactly. but all the key uh, corporations are fully involved in your negotiations. And if you look at it, its chapter on labor and environment doesn't do anything very new. The focus in terms of advancing standards to suit the interests of transnational is, uh, capital, particularly U.S., is more on intellectual property and this extraordinary provision by which uh, companies can prosecute governments for loss of profit because of government policy. I suppose I say tomorrow, asbestos is prohibited. Today I can prohibit it. Now, if I'm part of TVP, they can file a case on me as a government saying we, have, we are going to lose profits to so compensate us. Isn't this allowed under WTO also? So you say it is WTO plus in terms of uh, removing yes. trade and investment barriers, yeah. but it is less yeah. than uh, European Economic Union in terms of uh, uh, reducing uh, trade and uh, investment barriers. That is one. But secondly, aren't you allowed, aren't companies allowed under WTO to take governments, uh, uh, you know, for arbitration if they lose money because uh, of government policy? Yes and no. Look, the normal rules within WTO are that only contracting parties can take each other to uh, dispute settlement. But you're right, there is a provision for arbitration between companies and any other entity. But the crucial difference is that under ICSID or UNCITRAL, which are the two most popular arbitration systems, the consent of the other party is essential. Under TPP, as it has been drafted under Chapter 9, if you sign the TPP, it is deemed that you have agreed to uh, accept arbitration either by ICSID or by UNCITRAL. We are not in ICSID, by the way, India. So in our case, if we were ever to join, either we would have to get into ICSID or we'd have to follow the UNCITRAL system. But this is the crucial difference that the, uh, it can, firstly, only a corporate can be a claimant against a party. The government cannot sue a corporation under TPP and the government has no option. You can't say, no, I don't accept arbitration. I fear, in fact, that this is going to be mm -hmm. one of the most hotly contested issues because under TTIP, uh, the that German trans -trans -Atlantic. The trans Atlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, yeah. the German judges have already issued a declaration saying this kind of arbitration is unacceptable. All right. Okay, we need to take a break at this point. We'll be back with this discussion in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the ramifications of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Mr. No, Sibyl, you wanted to say something. Was, unless I am wrong, that uh, actually we've been taken to, to arbitration uh, by companies under the double taxation avoidance agreement, which is why we now want to revise uh, these agreements because this has opened up uh, to this uh, vulnerability. Uh, secondly, in, apart from other areas, there are lots of areas in which... Uh, the TTP is supposed to set standards which go way beyond uh, what was agreed in the WTO, and that is the purpose behind uh, this um, th this organization to be set up. Um, the on on uh, patent on IPR issues on patent clinical trials data uh, data whatever it is uh, data collection or data storage whatever they call it technically. This is much more in advance okay. uh, on regulatory practices, much more yeah. in advance yeah. of the WTO. Okay. But when they say, when TPP says that it will boost trade, create jobs, improve the living standards of the countries involved, <laughs> how rhetoric. will it do that? That's rhetoric, no? It may, it may, as between these countries, it may uh, help out, obviously. But I don't think it's going to have a global effect 
In fact, we are worried, as our own Commerce Minister has said, that this would impact our exports. Yeah. And uh, in fact, it will be damaging to our commercial interests. So it's not as if everybody is going to gain. Those who are out of it may actually stand to lose. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shukla, why do some critics of uh, TPP argue that it would actually lead to loss of jobs in some countries like the US, that jobs will be offshored, it will reduce the standard uh, of living of the working class, it will push up cost of drugs as pharma companies uh, go for branded drugs and you know, uh, prevent uh, the selling of generic drugs. Uh, and they also say that TPP would weaken labor and environmental standards. So are they right in saying this? Um, one has to break it down individually. But I just want to come back on one thing about arbitration. Governments have been taken, but only with their consent. Okay. Or it's in the contract itself. Here, it, you don't have a choice. It's compulsion. That's the critical difference. Okay. Now, as far as losing jobs and all is concerned, of course, look, we have one parallel, sort of, which is NAFTA. And we've seen that under NAFTA, the Americans have lost jobs. But I think that is the critical point. Who are the real gainers? And who are the losers? I think on balance, you would say that as far as employment is concerned, certainly the higher wage countries are going to be losers. But look, you don't need a formal agreement. America has lost jobs, the whole world, the whole industrial world has lost jobs to China for, for the last 20 years or so without any free trade agreement. So it isn't necessarily an agreement that will cause this kind of problem, number one. Number two, as far as labor standards are concerned, no. My reading of TPP is that labor standards remain high, in fact, higher. And again, the Vietnamese and the Peruvians and all have had to make certain concessions. But as I said, they have, the Americans have negotiated this quite pragmatically in a, in a way. You know, they've got their, their few points on which there's been no give whatsoever. IPR is one of them and uh, arbitration is another. But on other things, they have allowed a fairly f long term gestation period for the countries concerned yep. to be able to do the implementing yep. both on environmental standards and on labor standards. Otherwise, frankly, they won't get the ratification. Okay. Uh, but, uh, See, the US, US uh, may have lost jobs, but the corporations haven't lost profits. Absolutely. Please remember Absolutely. that. But you know, uh, earlier you said that TPP allows or uh, paves the way for companies to sue governments. Uh, if because of government policy, they lose uh, profits. So can they sue governments because of the government's health policy or yes. education policy? Only because tobacco. That the only exemption is tobacco related. Yes, tobacco, tobacco related, related but is exempt. But let's say asbestos is not. Yeah. Uh, asbestos is a health hazard. And if a government decides that I'm going to ban asbestos, then the, uh, the foreign investor... But suppose and the government wants free health services, and free medicines. Yeah. Incidentally, the domestic investor cannot. My local company cannot take the government of India to court, but a foreign company working in India can. Yeah. Prabhat? Yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to say that there is an exemption. I mean, tobacco has been specifically named as an industry which will not be covered. Why? Well, there's a history to it. A lot of countries, including the US, but most aggressively Australia, have been attacking the tobacco industry for the kind of sales that they have been following and they so now they can't even put their brand names on boxes yeah. in in australia so they have uh, argued this point very forcefully no the point i'm making is that exemptions are permitted for public health for environment public order now it's a moot point i mean a guy can take me to court and may may win may not win but it's not as if nothing can be done in the interest of the environment or public health or public order Public the education, for example, is, for example, if the there's an American company is, sets up a university here yes. and Government of India does not give it grants like it gives to state-run universities, central universities, yes, yes. can it take Government of India to court saying that, look, you're favoring your universities and you're not favoring me? We are to, both in the same business. To my reading of TPP, yes. Yeah. The answer is yes, exactly. because yeah. national treatment yeah. is one of the principles of TPP. Okay. And please remember, there's something else moving around, which is the agreement on services which is also being pushed where this would happen. Basically, the whole trend is towards uh, protecting the interests of corporations. Remember this, the world is in value chains, but the apex of most of these value chains still rests in the United States or Europe. And in many ways, what you're protecting is the 
value chain. Okay. Uh, itself. Okay. Ambassador Sibyl, uh, is it all right to bring such sweeping changes in complete secrecy? Because these, uh, one of the criticisms of TPP yeah. has been that the negotiations are totally secret. The local voters, the lo local electorate doesn't know what their trade minister has gone and uh, negotiated. And then they're presented with this final thing, which is take it or leave it. And they've all taken it. They've all signed it. So mm. is it fair? Is it democratic to do this kind of a thing? I think this has been an issue and this has been written about, but it has not made any impact on the decision makers. Yeah. And uh, this is also true of the TTIP uh, also. So it's, it's, they have gone ahead and done this uh, because uh, this is a smoother way <coughs> of uh, <coughs> managing the process. Because if it is subject to public discussion, then all sorts of NGOs and others yeah. can get into the act and delay the process. So I think, as was rightly said earlier, uh, the push behind this is coming from uh, international corporations and, uh, and Western capital. And uh, we, can, we have seen uh, in this and other instances <coughs> that they have a great hold over government policy yeah. and government initiatives. But, uh, Mr. Shukla, uh, uh, wouldn't the electorate uh, <coughs> also uh, have a say now that the treaty has to be ratified? So how do you see, what are the chances of ratification of TPP in the US Congress coming as it does in the middle of a uh, election year? And you have uh, a Republican candidate, Donald Trump, criticizing it. And you also have uh, a Democratic candidate, Bernie yeah. Sanders, you know, coming out and against Hillary it. And Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And Hillary Clinton. Yes. Yeah. Look, ratification is going to be a, a tough process. I think they're going to try and push it this year because the fast track authority lapses when President Obama steps down. Also, the fast track authority says either approve it or That's reject right. it. Yeah, yeah. So they have to take the package as a whole. And uh, I think the Americans are going to try. Yeah. And the, the beauty of the ratification arrangement is that 85% of the GDP of the combined 12 must be behind the ratification, otherwise it doesn't come into Six force. countries, they've said. Six, Six plus 85. And 85. And 85. So 85 means America has a blocking vote. Okay. <laughs> so they, they will have to do it. Okay. I think they will try this year. Will they succeed or not? I don't know. Okay. I just want to make, uh, make one quick point, yep. and that is that so far we've been focusing on the negatives, which is fine. There are a lot of negatives. But, you know, when you talk about national treatment, it would help our pharma companies and it would help our IT-enabled or IT-enabled yep. services okay. companies because it provides for national treatment in America, in yep. Japan. Yep. It also provides separately, in a separate chapter, for freedom of travel. Okay. So some of our visa, business visa problems yep. could also get eased. So, except except and, that we are not members of TPP as of now. No, we are looking putatively, okay. if, if okay. ever, uh, so far. Right. I mean, uh, okay, so we yes, need to take a break again at this distance. point. We'll be back again in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the ramifications of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, uh, Dr. Desai, why has China been excluded from the TPP and why should the world's largest economy be absent from such a deal? Well, the China has been taking an interest in the TPP. They've also they welcomed aware, it. They are aware of what it means in the broader context. But actually, the gains to China from being part of the TPP, are, most assessments suggest, would be very limited. Was China deliberately kept out, even though it's clearly a Pacific uh, country? Possibly, because as, some, as you know, Kamal mentioned, as we also mentioned, the, the whole drive was to reassert U.S. control. And that would not work, because at, particularly when the TPP was negotiated, China wielded a lot of economic clout. And maybe it's different now. This certainly wasn't the case when TPP was. Okay. So it's possible. Okay. And there is a certain atmosphere in trade circles of looking at RCEP and TPP as two alternatives. One led by America, the other led by China. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Sibyl, could the TPP therefore mark the beginning of an economic cold war between the US and China and as they vie for influence in the uh, Asia-Pacific region? Well, I don't know whether this the beginning of an economic uh, <clears throat> cold war because given the extent of relationship that the two countries uh, have, uh, I don't think it will serve either country's uh, interest uh, to uh, engage in any cold war policies towards each other. I don't think it's possible. With Russia, it could have been done. With the Soviet Union, it could have been done. But clearly, the uh, United States wants to preserve its so-called hegemony. Uh, especially in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. And uh, this move, and the Americans have said that quite clearly, that this is also a strategic move. 
uh, which is part of the rebalance uh, towards the Asia Pacific. So keeping keeping China out is a deliberate they, policy. They say that yes, and uh, and in fact, if China were to join and accept all the disciplines that uh, the TPP uh, yeah. has agreed upon, then it'll begin. It'll mean actually a very vital and deep reform of the entire uh, Chinese system relating to SOEs and everything else. So China would have to make some very difficult uh, uh, choices if it were ever okay. uh, to think of joining the TPP. Okay. Mr. Shukla, how will the TPP impact China's economy once it comes into being? And how would it impact uh, uh, rival initiatives by China, including One Belt, One Road, or is that separate? No, no, that's a very good question, actually. I think the, uh, I'll begin by saying that what the Americans are doing, both in Europe and in the Asia-Pacific, is meant to drive a wedge between China and its main trade and investment partners in this part of the world and Russia and its main European trade and investment partners. That is one of the strategic aims of the TTIP and of TPP. Now, I think the Chinese response has taken two forms. One is the RCEP and the FTAAP and so on, which aren't really making any progress. And the other is one belt, one road. And I think that is something which is going to be a matter of contestation for some time to come. Mm -hmm. The grave weakness in the Chinese one belt, one road is that Xinjiang is actually pivotal to anything that the Chinese are trying overland. And the South China Sea and the Malacca Straits are pivotal to anything they are trying at sea. And I think on both they have major vulnerabilities which the Americans are preparing to exploit. The Chinese riposte is going to be, as far as I can judge, to play on American economic weaknesses, of which there are many, by the way. We focus on Japanese and Chinese national debts, which are very high. The American debt is also pretty high. It's over 100% and rising. So uh, this is a vulnerability which, at least as far as I can see, is not going to be easy for them to fix. Again, Donald Trump and all have been talking about it. But so far, I have not heard anyone offering a solution to this. Okay. Uh, 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 Dr. They said, therefore, do you think a time will come when China will be ready to sign up to higher and more rigorous trade standards? Uh, all the issues that uh, Ambassador Kaval Sibyl pointed out, uh, uh, you know, the, which are real challenges for the Chinese economy, including state-owned enterprises, how they are run. So do you expect China to, to apply for a membership of uh, TPP in the future, considering that China's key trading partners include four TPP countries, Aust Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam and Japan? Yes, but uh, in, uh, in, at least as far as Australia and New Zealand are concerned, not much of their trade is going to be seriously affected by this because no, it's not as if they can divert, the, the, Australia cannot divert its iron ore and coal anywhere else. So I, wouldn't, I, I don't think they are worried about this. No, I think uh, first, it's not a trade liberalization move. It's an investment liberalization move. Let's be very clear about that. And whatever trade impact it has, it will be through the route of investment uh, liberalization. Will the Chinese, the Chinese are certainly taking a stronger interest than we are. And let me be very clear. I'm not saying India should stay. India, in fact, I would have, if India should have been there in TPP, talking to them, watering the thing down. Now you're stuck with Were having- we invited? Hmm? Uh, yes, there was, I think we could have been part of it, yes. Okay. And so even now were, it's listed we, as one of the countries where they may start. No, no, more than that, we were invited when Vice President Biden came to India in 2013. He spoke in Mumbai and invited us to join. But we, we didn't. And I'll tell you something more. That there is one, one idea which may give us a clue as to why we didn't finally get the formal invitation. And that is that you know, South Korea expressed a desire to join and at least sit in as an observer. They were allowed in only after they had signed their bilateral FTA with the US. Our bilateral FTA with the US is not making much progress. Okay. Okay. Mr. Sibyl, uh, how should we view TPP now that it has been signed? Uh, you know, uh, what should be our attitude to it? How do we get into it? If we, or, and do we need to well, get into know, it? Well, you know, it's all right. Theoretically, we can say that when such a big trade block is being formed and we have very flourishing uh, trade relationships and you want to build greater relationship with the Asia-Pacific region, this is part of our Act East uh, policy and therefore we have to look very carefully at the impact of uh, the TPP on our trade. And as I said, uh, government is already uh, conscious of this. But we've not been able to 
actually digest the WTO uh, provisions fully. And we, are, have, we have contestation within the WTO, even with the United States, over trade facilitation and food security and everything else. Uh, what we need is a very deep reform uh, in so many areas within our own system before we can even okay. think of being eligible okay. for TPP. So okay. I think, by theoretically, yes, it would have made sense. But I'm afraid that we, we, we are not at all at the, okay. at, at the stage where we can join this, knowing uh, that we'd be called upon uh, to take decisions which politically we yeah. are not able to not take. Not able to take. Okay, so we've run out of time. I'd like to thank... Uh, all of you, Ambassador Kaval Sibyl, Ambassador Prabhat Shukla, Dr. Nitin Desai for Thank coming you. and elaborating on TPP and making our uh, viewers understand what this uh, trade deal is all about. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week as usual. Till then, goodbye and thanks for watching India's World.